All right, so let's do um, a little bit of a review of, of negative externalities and, and how we can solve them. And so what I wanna do uh, is give you three solutions. Really two are kind of the same, um, but one is really clever and I wanna separate that one. Okay, so the first solution that we're gonna give uh, would be, it's called a per uh, unit tax. And the second solution will be a percentage tax. Um, and the third one, I'm just going to call it a clever solution for now because it's clever and I don't want to spoil it. Okay. Uh, also, I am recording this on my iPad, but because of some weird software stuff, I have to record it sideways. Um, I'll fix it so like you won't know, uh, but that's why like these lines here are sloping that way. And it's why you also will probably see things like this pop up that are in weird spots and don't make much sense to you. Uh, but that's that's why all of that's going on. OK, and so uh, let's just begin. So let's say we have a demand curve given by uh, P is equal to 120 minus 2Q. Uh, we'll call our private supply curve just S. Uh, let's say that's given by uh, P is equal to uh, 30 plus Q, and we'll call SC our social uh, supply curve. Um, uh, that'll be uh, P is equal to uh, 45 plus Q. Okay, so it's usually helpful just to, to draw kind of what we got. So let's just give a, a rough uh, drawing. This is obviously not to scale or anything, uh, but you know, we can, we can do some stuff with this, okay? Uh, so we'll do that and we'll do that. Okay, uh, so first off, what we might want to do is is solve for, you know, what the private market, oops, what the private market is going to do on its own, and then we'll compare that to, oops, I don't know why, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, okay, does not want to, there, good enough, okay. Uh, so we'll compare those two equilibrium. Okay, so let's start with uh, the first one, the private, oh, I should label these, uh, S and SC. Okay, so let's just start with where supply and, and private dem, uh, private supply and private demand cross. Okay, so that would be uh, 120 minus 2Q, set that equal to our supply curve, uh, 30 plus Q. Okay. And we can do some algebra and you end up with, you know, 90 is equal to 3Q. That implies that Q is equal to 30. You can plug that 30 back into either the supply or the demand curve. And you end up with P is equal to uh, 60. Okay, so we can label these points now. Okay, so this is 30. And this is 60. Okay, now we know that this is inefficient. Uh, but the question is, you know, how inefficient uh, is it? Okay, and the other question is, what sort of tax is it going to take to bring this into alignment? Okay, and here's kind of the trick. Um, the trick is to notice the difference between the two supply curves. Okay, and if you look, the only real difference is is right here. Right the social supply curve is 15 units higher uh, than the, the private one. And so what that would imply is that there needs to be a $15 per unit tax uh, to solve this problem. And indeed, that is the answer, okay? Uh, and so if you wanna solve for the socially optimal amount, right, all you'd have to do is uh, set the private demand, so 120 minus 2Q, equal to uh, 45 plus Q, right? And through some algebra that I'll kind of let you go through on your own, it looks remarkably similar to the previous algebra, uh, you end up with the uh, social supply or quantity uh, equal to 25 and the socially correct price equal to uh, 70, okay? But there's another way. So that would be the first way. The first way is to add a per unit tax. So in this case, the tax is equal to $15 per unit uh, sold. Okay. Uh, you'll notice that we implicitly put this tax on the producer. 
Okay, and the idea behind that uh, is to say that uh, the negative externality is caused you know, by the producer. It's their fault for the existence of the negative externality. And so they're the, the side uh, that should, you know, in principle, pay the tax. Now, obviously, if you've taken uh, a different economics course where we covered how taxes work and the algebra behind it, uh, you know that the economic effect of a tax is the same you know, regardless of whether you place the tax on the buyers or the sellers, uh, the incidence is the exact same. Uh, the only difference is, you know, who is legally obligated to mail in the money, so to speak. Okay. Um, I should also point out that when you, when you have sort of this uh, as, your, as your solution, when you have a per unit tax, uh, it's actually remarkably easy to figure out where the tax revenue is going to be. And there, the tax revenue is just going to be uh, this box right here, okay? Uh, and so this right here uh, just becomes tax revenue. And it's easy to tell what the tax revenue is, right? Oh, I should continue down to here, 25, okay? Uh, and so the idea is like the tax revenue, right? That's equal to the tax times the units, All right? And so that would be $15 times 25 units, uh, which leading mathematicians would say is $375, okay? Uh, and so that's an easy way. That's probably the easiest solution uh, to these types of uh, Pigouvian tax problems. All right, so now let's do um, a different solution. It's the same kind of solution. We are going to impose a tax to solve this externality problem, uh, but it's a percentage tax rather than uh, a per unit tax. Uh, the algebra is a little bit different, but the basic intuition uh, is, is pretty much the same, okay? There's a slight difference in, in the algebraic uh, means of solving it, uh, though not terribly difficult. Okay, uh, so the first thing we want to note is that rather than trying to shift the supply curve up, what we could instead try to do is rotate it so that the private supply curve uh, after rotation happens to cross at the same equilibrium point as the socially optimal amount. Okay, uh, and so to do that, we have to add a percentage tax. Okay. And a percentage tax uh, works kind of like this. There's, there's a really easy solution to it, um, given that we know what that equilibrium point is. Again, uh, that equilibrium point uh, is given by, you know, Q is equal to uh, 25 and P uh, is equal to 70, okay? So given that we know that, we can actually solve this relatively quickly, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with our uh, normal or private supply curve, you know, P is equal to uh, 30 plus Q, uh, but we're going to add something to it, okay? So rather than adding 15 like we did uh, to solve for uh, the, the per unit tax, uh, what we're going to do instead is we're going to multiply just the price by the quantity 1 minus uh, some tax rate. Okay. And the reason why it's one minus is because what we're saying is that the producers are going to keep fewer dollars for themselves. So we're going to subtract the amount of the tax that they have to pay from the amount of money that they get. Okay. So it's one minus T and it has to be the quantity one minus T. Okay. And so then what we can do uh, is we can start plugging uh, things that we know in. Um, I prefer to expand this first just because I think more clearly like that. Uh, so we're going to do, this becomes P minus uh, PT is equal to 30 plus Q. Now we're going to plug these numbers in uh, where they're appropriate. So we have 70 minus 70T is equal to 30 plus 25. All right. And now we're just solving uh, for T. Okay, and so we have uh, 70 minus 70t is equal to 55. Uh, this implies that uh, if I subtract 70 from both sides, I get negative 
70 uh, t is equal to negative 15. Uh, those minus signs will cancel out. Uh, and t is therefore equal to uh, roughly 0 0.21, uh, which means we need a 21% tax. Okay, uh, so we can solve it uh, this way as well, right? This will get you the exact same answer uh, in terms of society, right, as the $15 per unit tax. It's just this way, uh, we're doing it as a percentage tax in much the same way that you do your sales taxes, you know, at the grocery store, the gas station, you know, wherever. So the final solution that I want to pose to you here um, is a theoretical one. Uh, but it is one that we do use in the real world, uh, at least from time to time. And it's clever because it, uh, it flies in the face of what most people would normally think, which is why I kind of want to share it with you. Okay? Uh, so we're all familiar with the familiar adage that you know, two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, you don't put out fire with, you don't fight fire with fire, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? Okay. Uh, and so here's, it relies on a little bit of prior knowledge that you may or may not have. And if you don't, it's fine. I'll, I'll make a separate video once, um, uh, once I'm feeling a little bit better, I'm starting to get a little clammy right now. So I need to take a break after this one, but I, I wanted to do it, um, and, and show you. Okay. And so here's the solution. We can use monopolies. Okay. Now recall that a, a monopoly is the case where you have only one seller of a particular good. Okay. And that's it. One. Okay. And the idea behind a monopoly is that they are going to restrict output and raise price. Okay. So they are going to go to a, a output level that is below the perfectly competitive amount. And they're going to charge a price that is higher than the perfectly competitive market equilibrium price. But notice that that's exactly what we want to happen in the case of a negative externality. The perfectly competitive price would get you here, right? And the actually socially, you know, uh, optimal amount is here, okay? And so what we want is exactly what a monopolist is going to do. We want there to be a restricted amount of output compared to the uh, privately optimal amount, right? And we want the price to be higher. And so what we can do is we could grant a negative externality providing firm a monopoly, okay? And so here's how you would uh, solve that, okay? So um, I'm going to skip the, the formal proof of this. This will be in that separate video about monopolies. Uh, but what we know is that a monopolist uh, will base its decision on its marginal revenue curve. Uh, and in this case, the marginal revenue curve can be derived from the demand curve. And the simple solution is that the marginal revenue curve uh, slopes down at twice the rate of the demand curve. So that means that it would be equal to 120 minus 4Q. Uh, the proof of it, uh, there's a couple different proofs. One that's, that's trivially easy uh, relies on calculus. Uh, the other one is a little bit longer. Uh, I'll make proofs of, of both of these and I'll walk you through what a monopoly is and how it works uh, in a separate video. Uh, but if you've taken, you know, ES211, or even better, ES311, uh, monopolies should be something that you're, you're fairly familiar with, okay? Uh, but anyway, so we get 120 minus 4Q. We set that equal to our supply curve. So 120 minus uh, 4Q is equal to 30 uh, plus Q. Uh, and what you end up with is 90 equals 5Q. Uh, and in this case, uh, Q is equal to 18 and P uh, becomes equal to, uh, hang on, where did I put it, 84, okay? Now, if we compare that to, you know, these numbers here, right, what you find, you know, is that the quantity for society's optimal point is 25, and the optimal price is 70. Uh, so the monopolist is overshooting it a little bit, right? They're producing a little bit less. They're seven units less than what is socially optimal, and they're charging 14 you know, dollars higher than what is socially optimal. Okay, um, and so here's kind of the the trick. Or there's two kind of tricks we can think about. Uh, first, with a negative externality. So here's kind of one argument. Uh, first, uh, would you rather be 
uh, overproducing uh, negative externalities or underproducing. Right. So in a world where uh, you can't use taxes, you can't, for whatever you reason, use a regulation. OK, so maybe you just can't get them through the political process. Maybe some group or whatever is just going to you know, in, uh, refuse to pass new tax legislation. Right. Uh, what you could instead do is is give this firm, give a firm monopoly privileges and say, OK, you're the only one that exists. Um, and then what you've done is you've transformed a, a problem where there was too much pollution going on uh, into a problem where there's actually too little, right? And given the choice between having too much of a bad thing or too little of a bad thing, well, you know, you might choose too little. Uh, yes, they're both inefficient. I don't dispute any of that. Uh, but, you know, you might, reasonable reasonable people might say uh, that having too little production of something that produces pollution is better uh, than having too much of it. Okay. Um, the second argument is a little bit more finicky, and I'm I'm not going to go through how to solve it uh, because it's it's beyond the scope of what we need for this class, uh, and I'm not going to test you on this particular aspect of it. But the second solution uh, is to say, you know, maybe it's not a strict monopoly, uh, but you give out licenses, so you only allow. Uh, a certain number of firms into the market. So you give out uh, not monopoly privilege, but like a duopoly where you have two or a triopoly where you have three, you know, something like that where you say, uh, okay, you know, this many firms are allowed to exist in the marketplace and only this many. Okay. And if you do that, you can end up, if you do it the right amount, you can end up at the socially optimal point. Okay. Uh, and that's kind of the, the trick is, is this, quantity right here is all that we care about, right? The only thing we care about when trying to solve negative externalities is getting to this socially optimal quantity. And then once we ensure that that's happening, the idea is that we kind of just let what we could call the market uh, take care of the pricing for this thing, right? The amount is the important part. Uh, the price is of secondary or even tertiary consideration, okay? And so these taken together are, are three uh, policy solutions that don't rely on regulation. Uh, well, I guess the third one kind of is regulation. Uh, but uh, you, can, you can do a per unit tax, which we did in the first case. You can do a percentage tax, which we did in the second case. Or uh, you can combat uh, negative externalities by giving out monopoly privileges. Okay, so uh, this is why, to me, it's one of my favorite solutions, not from a real world perspective, but because it's just so uh, counterintuitive to what everyone thinks. Right. And most people would say there's never a case to be made for uh, granting monopoly privileges and they're wrong. Right. The case, uh, or at least they're potentially wrong. Uh, there is an argument that a monopoly is actually socially productive and socially correct if it's the case that you have a negative externality and you can give out the right number of licenses uh, to firms to enter that market.